Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. A little while back, we talked about well-strung guitars in this episode, and I told you we would also check out their Instagram page, because sometimes things are exclusive here. Or they sell before they get put on the shop's page, or sometimes they just feel like sharing photos on Instagram. Here's the ones that stood out to me. Starting with this ridiculous Telecaster. When I first saw this, I thought, is that like a really weird stripy Karina body? Because, you know, occasionally vintage Karinas did exist, at least in the Stratocaster world as far as I know. But this really looked like a modern day Telecaster, like a custom shop piece or something. But then I go over here and read the description. Okay, so this was birthed by the guy who also birthed the Rosewood Telecaster that George Harrison used? Okay. So when I found out that this was a 70s Telecaster, apparently left the factory in 1975, that just blew my mind. But then I realized that's not just a one-piece body here that just happened to have fascinating wood grain. These stripes are layered wood. So this is made out of ash. It's got some alder. There's rosewood in there. There's mahogany. Just about every single piece of wood that Fender has ever used on a body. All blending into one instrument with a black guard even has the cover on it. This is such a cool piece. And if that's not enough for you, it's got a rosewood neck, maple cap with matching skunk stripe on the back, and some of the wood even has some pretty intricate figuring. That's a Telecaster. That's cool. It's old. It's got a story. I fully agree with what they're saying here. It takes a crazy guy like me to appreciate this piece. But at the same time, I mean, you could just make a replica of this. Get a rosewood neck from one of the George Harrison Telecasters that are selling for way too much now on the used market and have Warmoth make you a custom body. It's not that we couldn't make this again. It's cool because it does exist in the 70s, which is the whole story of well-strung guitars. That's why they get people like Kirk Hammett visiting and they get the guys at Gibson to actually buy a real Explorer. <laughs> but just like the last episode, they don't publicly list their prices, probably because they're not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but I have no idea. What do you guys think? 30, 40,000? I mean, a normal early 70s Telecaster looks like they list somewhere around 4,000. But I'm not really all that familiar with 70s history. I mean, Lake Placid Blue custom color. Somebody wants 20 grand. I'm not sure if that's crazy, but I would price that one kind of like a custom color, but maybe even a little bit higher. Next up, my favorite hollow body of Gibson, the ES-295. So Scotty Moore's used them, among many other people, but what makes this one fascinating is the color. Now I know from making the videos on them that there's this elusive Argentine gray finish that you don't see too often. And that's exactly what this is. It's kind of like a pale tobacco sunburst, I guess. But this is one of the later 295s that has humbucker pickups. That just kind of makes this a fantastic piece, especially the fact that it's in really exceptionally clean condition for the age. This particular version is a 1959. And hey, is that a Rosewood Top Les Paul Custom I'm seeing back there? Just might be. There's that sparkling burgundy that we saw in the other one. It pains me to know that all these cool custom color, really rare vintage guitars are just sitting on a wall like at a guitar center. That, that'd be so cool to see. And they even did it on the back. But I'm really digging the neck on this. That's kind of where that gray hue comes from. Argentine gray, cool color. Next up, I get excited when I see the first reissue of this model show up from late 90s, early 2000s. But to actually see a real 1957, this is a Mickey Baker Les Paul custom. So what's interesting about this, you zoom in here, uh, three knobs in a line, kind of like the Switchmaster ES5 styling. And these are individual volume controls. So neck volume, middle volume, bridge volume. But up here, it's where the nickname, the Master Tone model comes from. Not Master Tone the brand, Master Tone from, this is your Master Tone control for everyone. These are interesting guitars. You can check out my documentation of a reissue of this, but this looks like a, a real deal 50s model, which is like, yeah. I told you guys earlier, I don't really pine after the original 50s because I can buy a lot of guitars for that kind of money that bring me more happiness. But to have a vintage oddball, you know, th that's something that's just in my style. So one day, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't be too bad to own one of these original Mickey Baker style Les Paul Customs. Although I'd be really curious to see how these are priced. Because vintage customs, I mean, something nice like this, what, what are they running? Like between 60 to 80,000 on asking prices, sometimes a little bit more. So is this considered more valuable or less valuable? Because there's less people who would actually want this. Normally when you think Gold Bigsby, three pickups, you want the regular Jimmy Page style, right? Because rarity does not always equal more valuable. Like apparently some of the original Les Pauls can have mahogany tops to them. And I'm not talking the customs, I'm talking the Les Paul standards. But according to the vintage price guide, they sell for 10% less because it's 
less traditional. It's not what everybody wants. Whereas in my mindset, it should be more valuable because it's way more rare. But that's a stellar piece. And speaking of some cool stuff here, check this guy out. Now this is rare, but not so rare that you're never going to see it kind of like those other guitars. This is an original EBO F. The F stands for fuzz tone. That's right. All the way back in the mid 60s when, you know, those pedals were first coming out, they had the great idea to blend it inside a guitar. Absolutely fantastic, right? <laughs> I've always wanted to demo one of these. They're not all that expensive in the grand scheme of things as compared to other things we've been talking about. And this one has really cool wood grain and appears to be in great shape. No wonder it's in their whole museum collection. And it appears there might have been some different models with different controls. So if you want an interesting bass in your collection, you can actually go to Reverb right now. This one has a publicly listed price of, don't worry, you don't have to hold your breath on this or anything, only 3,500 bucks. I mean, in comparison to to these other guitars. <laughs> yeah, relatively affordable, but vintage Gibson EBOs really aren't that expensive to begin with, but that model definitely does sell for a slight premium. But next up, we go back to Fender territory. This absolutely blew my mind. Did Fender do Silver Burst first? This was a custom order done for Eddie Bertrand, one of the pioneers of surf music, playing in groups such as Eddie and the Showman, the Bel Airs, and the Challengers. I haven't listened to much of any surf music at all, but... I can appreciate this for what it is. It nearly looks identical to a silver burst just on a Stratocaster. Even looking down here, it appears to have some sort of like a silver base coat, but they just called it Sparkle Burst. But I love this when you're talking about vintage guitars. Old photos of them with it. I mean, that just looks like silver burst. So silver burst didn't come out for Gibson until 1977. That's the first prototype. As far as we found documented, it has a 77 serial number. The first half year is in 1970. The first full year is 1979. So I don't know about your guys' math, but yeah, according to me, 1963 is way before that. So instead of worshipping Adam Jones, should we be worshipping Eddie? But anyways, it's a miracle they still have this trem plate cover. It's like, who keeps those things around? I would love to see Fender do a limited edition run of this. Like custom shop age relic, just copy this guitar. I think this one deserves it. That would be a cool stories collection. And even though Fender doesn't do it too often, they should definitely do do it on the neck too but it looks like we got some flame figuring on this one so pretty good that they didn't definitely an interesting color that's aged cool looks like other custom colors are asking 70 to 80 thousand i'm not sure if they're getting that again it's not my market but i'd imagine something like that six figures maybe it's got to be pushing close to six figures because not only is that custom color but it's also celebrity owned but this next one brace yourselves look at it it's a Firebird 7. Firebird meets Les Paul custom style appointments. You get three mini humbuckers, ebony fretboard, block inlays, cool vibrola. But this one, <laughs> it's, it's from 1965 and the, the wings, they're flamed. Like, you don't find flamed mahogany like that hardly ever, let alone in the mid-60s. And trust me, it's hard even to find a Firebird 7 in general from this era. So to find one with all that, that's that's insane. That That's just unfair. <laughs> I love it. That's a Firebird I would proudly own in my collection. That one even got Cesar's attention here. I bet it's in his personal collection now. But now I want to talk about vintage tenors with you guys. So if you don't know what a tenor guitar is, check out my Fender Tenor Tele episode. Basically, it's the top four strings of a guitar. You don't have your low E and A. And these were popular when banjo players were kind of transitioning into guitar. Is apparently the story of them. But occasionally, you can find weird Gibson Les Paul specials. Sometimes you'll find like arch top models that are a little bit weird. But the ultimate mac daddy of the tenor guitars in my opinion is this guy right here it's an sg it's got humbuckers only four pull pieces exposed it's got a rinky dinky tiny little baby abr1 bridge it's got a bigsby on it which i'm not too crazy about but hey it's blingy but nothing and i promise you nothing can prepare you for this headstock no i'm not showing you the wrong photo that's that that's the right photo it has a firebird headstock <laughs> Rumble Seat Music had this one at one point in time, and they did a review and demo on it. And I've wanted to own one of these vintage tenors for a long time, because typically they're less expensive than the, the six-string brethren, because 
Let's face it, unless you're a weird collector guy like me, you probably don't want this unless you're one of the very few tenor guitar players that still exist, and I'm not saying that they don't exist out there. But survey 10 professional guitarists, and maybe one would say they would play this. But I was trying to find this guitar a couple of years ago, and then, yep, there it is. Of course, it was at the Songbirds Museum or something like that. Such a weird, freaky guitar. I like it. But speaking of banjo players, take, take a look at this. 1959 Gibson Les Paul double cut kind of maybe maybe we should call it the triple cut electric banjo so it's kind of got tenor guitar elements to it as far as they have to cap off the additional pole pieces with the mother of pearl usually they're just regular pickups under there just like the ABR1 bridge apparently those are perloid inserts this has also got the Bigsby only two controls but then we get like the banjo tie style inlays on this and then it's a Gibson banjo neck. I mean, what were we expecting? <laughs> but it's just so strange how it's a, a chopped off body. And apparently this is factory. This isn't modified stuff. I'd be scared of how you know this stuff is original, but if that's not enough for you, Stinger on the back of the headstock. Custom ordered four string electric guitars. Just, they're so doofy looking. That's why I love them. It's because I feel bad for them. I want to give them all a great loving home. All right, troglodytes, let me know which one is your favorite down in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.